You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who've been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Benjamin Boyce has documented on his YouTube channel a huge volume of extensive and robust interviews about the topics of gender identity and transition. Today we turn the tables and we interview Benjamin. He tells us about his childhood, his family, and growing up in a very intense and cult-like religious group. Always searching for meaning through words and narratives, Benjamin found his life took many fascinating twists and turns and ultimately landed him at Evergreen State College. He began his YouTube channel while he was documenting the chaos and disintegration at this Washington State liberal arts school, and he found his way to the topic of transgender activism. Benjamin was very gracious in sharing a lot of intimate aspects of his upbringing with us, and we reflect together about the current state and possible future direction we might take in our understanding of male, female, masculine, and feminine. Here's our conversation with Benjamin Boyce. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. How is it going? It's going very well. We have a very special guest today. Lucky us. Hello, Benjamin Boyce. Hello. How are you doing? (laughs) We're doing great. We're so glad to have you here. Um, I imagine much of our audience will be familiar with your work, but we wanted to talk with you and kind of ask you some questions because you've been... uh, having conversations and interviews with so many people that are part of the whole gender world and gender debates. And we really wanted to understand what it's been like to be on the receiving end of all of these pieces of wisdom and these stories. So thank you so much for coming on our show. And oh, and well. I want to hear Very all happy. about who is Benjamin. I've been listening for so long and I've been thinking, but where's he coming from? And yeah, yeah, evergreen and all that. But where did all this, where did this all come from? Because in a, to me, just from over in Ireland, it feels like an extraordinary commitment. And hmm. I'm like, OK, so people don't have that level of commitment. And it feels that like that to me without a, a, a kind of an interesting backstory behind okay. it. Yeah, or agenda. Or agenda. Yeah, you can't or discount agenda. that I might have an agenda. Oh, <laughs> or, or, or agenda fluid. Gender dad jokes here on the Wider Lens podcast. Oh, yeah. Do you guys get enough j- dad jokes? I mean, that's a, I get a, lots of dad jokes in. Stella okay. knows. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, represent the dad. So, where you want to begin? Well, I'd like to begin with what were you like as a kid? I'm sorry to be so trite, oh. but that's what I would like to hear about. Genuinely, what was I like as a kid? Yeah. I okay. Would like to in know that. in the context of of what. Where did you grow up? What sort of child did you have? Did okay. you have any sort of Childhood. identity crisis, or was there mm. a is there a kind of a natural? I can see why I'm talking about this day in day out. Now I know, Sasha, you want to move on to the other stuff, but I've got to get all this in. I'm sure there's it. more than me who's wondering all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born in California in uh, Mendocino County. I think uh, I think Ukiah is in Mendocino County, and uh, my parents were. You know, just starting out, they had been married for two years. They were really young. I think my mom was 20 when she had me. My dad was 24. Or she was 22 and he was 26, but I think he was 24. And she was 20. And they just lived in a trailer. My dad drove forklift. He really wanted to be a pastor. Uh, that was his uh, calling. He had a calling for that. And uh, But they found each other at Bible college and just had this big nuclear explosion of togetherness. And then they moved out into uh, her hometown of Willits, which is this tiny little shanty town, really, really poor. And they lived in a trailer. Uh, and uh, then, well, I, I guess if we're going to get into my childhood, one big thing that, that kind of informs a lot of my work, publicly facing work, is that my dad really had a calling to be involved in ministry. And they found a church where there was a very charismatic leader. 
who was incredibly uh, magnetic and my dad kind of, I, I don't want to tell his story for him or something, but I think that it might be fair to say that he kind of fell under the spell of, of this man. This man's name is Gordon and he'd been shot while he was working at a fast food restaurant. And so he was paralyzed from the waist down. So there's this figure in the back of my head of this uh, wheelchair bound man who was very powerful. And he would give these long um, explanations of the Bible and there, it was just kind of a pickup church. So there wasn't like a Sunday school. So I'd be in the church kind of drawing and then watching him draw these pictures of like how salvation works and making these maps of, of the spiritual journey and stuff like that. But as time went on, he became more and more controlling and they started getting into uh, demonology uh, of uh, exercising uh, people and, and doing a lot of, uh, he kind of had a second, this is really fascinating. This man, Gordon had this woman that was kind of his spiritual child who would receive, uh, these prophecies for other people. And she started to manipulate like how families operated and they started taking men and women and putting them in different families and renaming everybody and constructing these, uh, you know, and so my dad inherited two children, these two 20 year old <gasps> people who took on his name. One of them still has his name. And then they moved in with us. And then my mom was taken out of our family and given to another family. What age were you when, let's say, well, I was, any of we left happened. when we was five. So this is when I was three, four and five. This is like really early childhood. So this is how the, the family <sighs> structure was being controlled. Okay. Keep going. So your mom was given to somebody else. Yeah, my mom became the daughter of somebody else, and she had some really intense experiences where, you know, um, she had been, well, one story is, this, is, and this is kind of deep for the beginning of a podcast, but one story that she told me was that they uh, decided that she was possessed and needed to be exercised. So they took her into this room, and all these men surrounded her and put their hands on her, and she kind of flipped out and she's she remembers the story that she was throwing men across the room like she just went into this hyper state of you know uh which is not my mom at all um but that's one thing that happened and also uh they had three children and uh this is really personal but um it's part of the background. So uh, they, my mom got herself so she wouldn't have children anymore. And then the week afterwards, that prophetess came up to her and said, you're going, you need to have more children or like you're, you're disobeying God. So they paid to have my mom on, you know, and then she had two more kids. So, uh, you know, the family did uh, grow after that. Okay. So you, you have this background to where your family was involved in a really very intense and almost like an extremist kind of faith group. Mm -hmm. And I know you've alluded to that. I, I didn't know the details of that, but that sounds like really like fascinating background and part of, you know, your, your family's lineage, like there's something really interesting there. Do you, well, fast forward, I'm keep, well, not fast forward, but why don't you going. pick up from there? That's yeah. really fascinating. So your mother had more children with this other family, I suppose? No, 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 oh. um, no, 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 uh, no. So she, there was no, uh, I, don't, I do not believe that the cult went in the direction of actual sexual uh, things. It was more on the level of the family. So I think that they still power, maintained. By the sounds. Yeah, power it was more about, yeah. yeah, very powerful. But um, eventually, so I, that was the background, but I was very imaginative. I was having a lot of dreams and visions and speaking to weird creatures and stuff like that, you know, and, and having dreams and prophecies myself, you know, and stuff Were like you that. Were you immersed which I, in it? Were you I, all so part of it? The, I didn't really get the language at all um, of what they were doing. And I wasn't really indoctrinated myself, but I was just very imaginative. Like I had like imaginary friends that would like talk to me and, you know, scare me because they'd like come up at me in, in bed and stuff like that, you know. So and, you know, like I, rem I remember just having waking dreams, like these crazy experiences and stuff. So that but that's just a normal childhood. This is before five. So there's just a lot of really vivid dreaming, but pair that with a culture or a cult that puts in, uh, empowers meaning, like, like turns up the dial of meaning to a very extreme degree where these things, the language means something, names mean something. The, uh, everything has a very, uh, 
solid value that ties us to, you know, a beginning and an end. And then like you know, with the exorcism stuff, you know, there are these invisible forces that have uh, uh, humanoid like uh, qualities to them. So uh, that really informed my the really the basis of my imagination is that like a lot of the uh, things that we believe are really real. Not, they don't have to be true, but they're very, very real. And uh, so, but anyways, my, my parents, um, my dad tells a story where he was, uh, so he inherited a son who's probably somewhere in his 20s. The guy worked at Intel. I remember we would take uh, trips to the Intel plant and see these microchips that were like that big, you know, which are now uh, microscopic. But the, this boy, this, this young man who had been put in our family, uh, his parents had a problem with that. So my dad and him went over to, to speak to, I think it was John's parents. I can't remember, but they spoke, my dad was trying to explain what was going on in the church. And my dad talks about how he was talking through this stuff. And he's like, this is all nonsense. Everything that I'm saying is nonsense. Like I'm trying to, trying to explain this thing, but like it, it doesn't, it's not real. Uh, so they took us on a trip. They planned a trip to Disneyland, if I recall correctly. And of course the extended family came along to Disneyland and there's photos of us all like going through Disneyland, but on the Sorry, the, the extended back, family being the family that you, you were paired with. Yeah. The, the, the two church. extra children, the two extra like spiritual children, quote unquote. And I know people can't see the, my gestures. So I do a lot of gestures that don't yes. translate to <laughs> podcast. I was doing air quotes around that. Uh, but on the way back, mom and dad figured out how to kind of just sit together up front. And there's this story that they told me about dad just propositioning. What if, what would you think about us leaving and moving to my parents and, and leaving the church? And my mom talks about how she thought she was being tested, right? Because mm -hmm. it was a cult. So, mm -hmm. you know, am, am I going to be tested? Her and there was, cor there was corporal punishment involved they would actually you know spank adults who would get out of line um but she they just kind of figured out that they'd been separated and that they both were totally unhappy and so they initiated the process of moving and i do remember this i think this informs me a lot because we were all a part of a community and as soon as my parents removed uh themselves from that community all of my friends, uh, they, they, I was, I was outcast. And so I was ridiculed on the playground and I was, I was less than a human. I was, a, I was all of a sudden an outsider. And, the, and that was when I was five, I believe. So it was you know, kindergarten or first grade. Yeah. On, on the playground, my, my blood brother, who we're, we're friends now again, but you know, we, we, we were going to be blood, blood brothers. I remember this, we were going to be blood brothers, but we couldn't get up the stomach to cut ourselves. Uh, but later that day, we, like I skinned my uh, sh uh, shoulder or something and he skinned his knee and then we like put them together and we made like a blood pack <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> I don't well, think you're allowed a, to do that in this day Another age. boy from the church. Another yeah, boy another from boy this from the culty church. But, church. And yeah, what happened yeah. after so, five then? So, so much happened at yeah. such an early age and yeah. then they left? Yeah, they left. They, uh, my dad and mom, we moved to LA and then initiated a process of just moving and looking for a church and moving and looking for a church and moving and looking for a church. And so I didn't finish a full grade of school until sixth grade because we'd move in the middle of the school year every year. Um, Whoa. there's like, a, a, like this, uh, kind of restlessness or diaspora, if that's how you pronounce it, diaspora, diaspora that we were on. So my, my background is that I, I kind of, I'm an outsider, you know, I show up and then I'm kind of the outsider and then like, I kind of make friends and then I'm kind of always the outsider. Or the outsider. And a questioner of the thinking. Yeah. yeah. Cause you, you see that thinking does has, does have a very strong impact, at least on a social level. If, if we're not, if we just say, you know, there's this thing called lived experience and then there's this thing called cultural understanding, which are both things that are being taken too far, but there is something different than material reality where we find and create meaning that is actually more important to our lives than, you know, how a molecule works or what shape the world is. Um, and so then beyond sixth grade, so are we, yeah. 
did you settle as a family? God, what a childhood. Little did I know. Yeah, we we eventually settled. We found a good church. Uh, my dad just really, really, really wanted to be a pastor. And, um, you know, the, it was always kind of just thwarted, uh, which I think is actually a good thing. And his life mirrors mine because when he was 40 and I was, I was 17, he's like, okay, I'm going to finally do it. I'm going to go to seminary. And so this is a little fast forward. I was, you know, we finally found a stable church and through my high school years, we had the same church and it was just this chill California church where it's about community and songs and youth group, you know, and, you know, uh, learning the Bible and stuff like that. And yeah, I was always kind of a trouble kid in Sunday school because I would always ask too many questions. I would always like break the Sunday school teacher because I knew that they're just kind of mouthing off and they didn't really know. So you just kind of like, you figure uh-huh. out my dad would really teach. He really taught. Um, I, I remember learning Greek with him. I don't remember any of it now, but we would memorize the Bible together. I would memorize the Psalms. And so it was part of my background to really understand, not just memorize the Bible, but really understand to translate it into a living document and to keep it as something that is, uh, you know, a roadmap. Um, and, you know, and so I was, I would play around with that in church, but they, he eventually left uh, when he was 40 and went to seminary. And that mirrors my life. Like when I was 36, I, I left my job and went to, you know, finally went to, to school, you know, at Evergreen. And then at the end of school, like this whole change happened with my life where I'm like no longer this one person, but I'm doing the work that we're talking about now. And and sorry to labor, but between 17 and 36, what were you doing in and around? Like, well, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> it's a long, it's a long time. Seventy <laughs> to so Just, just one of the years. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, so they left. So we were in California and they decided to go to Chicago where the uh, seminary was. And I'm like, I don't want to move again. So they let me finish up high school in California. And they, my dad initiated this process of uh, becoming a, a reverend or whatever they're called, a uh, pastor. And a master of divinity is what they're actually called when you actually do the thing. So uh, they left. I went to Bible college. I finished up high school. I went up to Bible college. And then I met up with them in Chicago. And uh, a year later, then they moved again back to California. I'm like, I'm not moving. I'm going to stay in Chicago. So I stayed in Chicago and got in a lot of trouble. And uh, then uh, figured out that that's being in trouble to that degree is not uh, sustainable for me. So I kind of got out of trouble. And then I uh, moved from Chicago to Portland, Oregon uh, because of a girl. And then I didn't know what to do and I didn't want to work in a cafe anymore. So I somebody had told me that I'd be good with kids. So I opened the Yellow Pages back when there was this thing called the Yellow Pages. And I called a preschool and then an answer and I called another preschool and I got a job at the second preschool. And then that's kind of what I did during the day. I would write my stories and then work uh, preschool. And that is kind of the shape of my 20s, I suppose. And then you went to college at 36. What did you do? I know you went to Evergreen, but I didn't know what to do. Well, over the course of that year, and that kind of goes back into, well, what do I do with all this meaning? And uh, my own personal development was that when I was 14, um, my compulsions uh, toward... uh, the opposite sex uh, became active uh, very intensely as <laughs> well nice as, said. <laughs> well, some yeah. of the people of the opposite he, he's sex. He's a master are, of euphemisms is what no, he is. I get really <laughs> no woke I, sexually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but also uh, poetically, like my creativity and my, and my, uh, uh, my eros and my poesis came really strong and they were completely, uh, bound up with one another. So I would, I would start playing with words, but I would always focus them on a female and then focus them on another female when I was finally convinced that I should, you know, she didn't want me or whatever. And then I just go and go and go. And then uh, it kind of developed into more narrative storytelling and stuff like that. Wow. So you became this kind of poetic lover from about 14 onwards and you were on a yeah. quest really for meaning by the sounds of it. Yeah, and yeah almost some sort of odyssey of wandering, kind of similar to where your family were at. Is that right? 
and yeah. wandered around yeah. and then somewhere along the way decided mid 30s I'm sorting myself out I'm going to go to college and become the person that I can be maybe. well so by the by the time I got to uh, Evergreen State College in Olympia Washington I had written around two and a half million words of you know prose and and narrative about I think it was like 16 novels or something like that. I kept on writing these novels and writing these novels and writing these novels. And and did you send them uh, off to get published? They just, they didn't work yet. They didn't work. They would always break down because the story, like my life, would just kind of stop and go to another story. Like the, the stories that I would write would stop stop before they were over and then turn into something else. And I would, I just had to figure out how to do this thing. And plus I was, I grew up with Tolkien over my head, Tolkien, uh, the fantasy author of Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, and then the Bible, you know, and then pair that with this crazy idea that meaning is really meaningful and that stories are really meaningful and we're really wanting to create a mythos and, uh, and, and really be ambitious with what is possible with narrative forced me to always be experimental and to break, you know, and to defy all the rules of narrative. But by the time I was 36, I, I was just at the, I was just done. I was like, what am I doing? Nobody sees me. I like have this store. I have this wealth of experience, but I'm completely unknown. I need to be accredited. I need to be involved in an intellectual community. Uh, and I need the, uh, this, you know, this academia, which I had, you know, raised my fist at, I wanted them to approve me finally, you know, because that seemed academia seemed to be the place to really get into rich fields of meaning. And it just so happened that Evergreen State College had the perfect setup on a uh, on the way that it was set up to be very independent-minded, very do-your-own-work, and very immersive in these various topics. And it was super incredibly cheap because it's a state school, and I was 36, so I had the Pell Grant. So it just made sense to get out of the, get out of the job market and just retreat into the life of the mind and, you know, and, and do what I wanted, become what I wanted, always wanted to be just like my dad, like always wanted to be a pastor. I always wanted to be an author. So and did you find that? that? I was very similar, by the way, I, I kind of, you know, didn't go towards intellectual life and I should have many years. And then I finally said, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to, mm. I'm going to go to third level. Kind of the same as you yielded to it. It was obvious what I should have been doing. So mm -hmm. I kind of understand you, but did it, did it feed your soul evergreen? Uh, it was, it was really great. I, the first two years, especially were just phenomenally engaging for me. And it was also interesting because I was surrounded by people half my age. I was kind of surrounded by – by the time I was a senior at Evergreen, it was it was possible that my first preschool class could be freshmen, right? So there was this big gap of mm -hmm. age. But what happens in that age is that, you know, I've worked. I've seen things fail. I've failed plenty of times. I've watched my dreams just, uh, you know – get dashed and get dashed and get dashed. And, you know, and plus I've, I've had to, you know, just have to get up and go to work and get up and go to work. So I just had a different kind of perspective on life and a different kind of appreciation for school than a lot of the people who were just fresh out of high school and just had to go to school. And then they ended up at Evergreen because it was cheap and uh, Evergreen sold itself to, um, by that time, Evergreen was at a particular position of just trying to get as many people at Evergreen as possible and marketing, just blanket marketing rather than selecting four students who would really be served by the independent model and the deep model of, ev of education that was formed to inform people with. And is it accurate to assume that you started your YouTube channel once you started documenting the Evergreen situation? Is that accurate to say? Well, the weird thing about the YouTube channel titled Benjamin A. Boyce, because I didn't have a clever name until a few months ago, or, well, actually, Brett Weinstein came up with Voice of Reason, but I'm That was now very good. I like that. Homeversations. Yeah, Voice of Reason is <laughs> pretty good. Um, the thing is, is that I was just like the poet 
who knew that poets are completely expendable and worthless in the world. You know, I'm like, I, I'm living in, in I'm, I'm a poet living in a time that has no need for poets, which isn't strictly true because rap and a lot of art has a lot of, there's a lot of salience, especially market salience with rap, especially rap, especially taps into the linguistic properties of English and exploiting them to magnificent means, which is just what I wanted to do. I had a, I had a aside. I had a dream that the world was ending, like, and the saints were descending from heaven, and it was kind of the job of the faithful to go around and and make sure that people were aware that the world is ending and that they need to kind of get their affairs in order and look up to heaven because it's over. And I was kind of going around driving an ambulance, and then I was kind of thrown into this room with all these books, and some little girl said, uh, "You can't leave." the world until you learn all this. And it was just rap. It was just, it was this huge room filled with rap. I'm like, I can't get out of this place until I learned how to rap, which is about, you know, really engaging with the word as the word. And that's what I ended up doing by the time I finally was able to tie up my poetic ambitions was to really get Are you saying that there's a rap career you have that nobody (laughs) knows about? Well, you know, dreams, they, they say one thing and they mean another Right. No, but so, you said then then I I had to do that. So did you? Well, my literature if and when people find my literature they'll, they'll see that it is all about rhyming and timing and rhythm and mm-hmm. and versification. I'm not a rapist in the <laughs> maybe a rapist a brapper. A brapper? voice, the brapper. I'm going with the bees. <laughs> What's a brapper? <laughs> I'm putting a B before a rapper. Sounds like a flapper. He's a bro, a bro rapper. Bra- is what he is. Bra- bra- rapper. Okay. I just, I don't, I can't do it like they do it. I'm not like hip hop do it. Like you the style do it is different. There. The I can't do it like they do it. <laughs> I, mean, I was so obsessed with rap most of my life. It was the first huh. kind of form of language that fascinated me. I, I mean, I'm like, a, I was obsessed like, I don't know. Like ingesting was, it or producing it? Ingesting it. And then also like, I mean, I, I knew a lot of people in that industry when I worked in the bar industry and I was thinking about the kinds of albums that my parents bought me when I was like 12 and I listen to that music now and I'm like, what were you thinking? This is so bad. <laughs> but anyway, so, 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 so you Sasha have- and Benjamin started a rap band. Is this where mm. we're going? I don't think that's a great idea, to be honest. Okay. But <laughs> just check. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, okay, so, so you're having these, this really like interesting and a, almost obsessive relationship with language. Yes. And fantasy and meaning and yes. symbols. Yes. Um, and you're writing and rewriting and re re rewriting these yeah. novels and these books. Then Evergreen happens, which, yeah. I mean, we could launch into a thing about that, but you've done so much content about it that we can kind of yeah. point audiences towards. What's a, a one paragraph summary of what Evergreen was? Just in case people are listening and they're like, what's Evergreen? What are they talking about? Give us, okay. give us a summary. The Evergreen State College is a very progressive college, and it was started in the 70s by a bunch of very progressive people. And by the time that I arrived on campus, progressivism had taken on uh, a a critical stance towards change, which means that they were um, defining everything as power relationships between the oppressed and the oppressor. Everything was about oppression. Oppression was the modus operandi, and solving oppression was the modus operandi, and that all was filtered through the lens of intersectional identity. So depending on where you are as an identity, you are a part of this virtual power uh, hierarchy that needs to be inverted. So a white male needs to watch every single word that he says about females, even to the fact of a you know a 120-pound girl trying to lift a, you know, a 120 pound speaker, me as, as a man coming up and offering her help is me exerting power over her. 
which ultimately is gravity uh, asserting unfairness <laughs> over uh, ability. Uh, but they, uh, in 2015, a new president came on and they made uh, race the central topic and specifically white and black race relations. And they launched an entire uh, multi-year training and seminar circuit where everybody was to pledge allegiance to this intersectional critical ideology. And they began to have church services where they would present data that was all doctored and then play these believing games where we need to believe that this is the problem. We're going to believe that we're going to solve this problem. They even went so far as to get the black students in the middle of a circle and then the people of color who aren't black and the, uh, you know, around them and then the white students around them and then all the teachers around them and they all sang songs. They per started to do rituals and I was watching this happen and it was making my skin crawl. Were you connecting the dots of, I've been around all this before? Well, it's, yeah, well, because we were in a cult, but also because we left the cult, but still church was important to us and the Bible was important to us. And I never went on a, I never could not believe that God existed. I knew and was connected to a spiritual understanding and a spiritual reality, like a reality um, that doesn't necessarily uh, obstruct physical reality. Actually, physical reality is a part of the whole thing. It's all connected. It's all holistic, but there's something higher than that. And human beings form languages and ceremonies and religions in order to connect higher order meaning to lower order meaning. And there can be a lot of weird things that go on when people begin to form that stuff. And when you're sitting in these uh, sessions where somebody says, okay, we're going to, I'm going to explain privilege to you. And they say there's race, sex, gender, religion, uh, class status. And we're going to say, who's the most privileged? And then they start to say white, male, uh, heterosexual, cis, Christian, capitalist, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wait, so you do that, but that means that they're to blame. And I'm older, and plus I understand that there's this thing that people do in order to get together, they're against something. And I've always been against uh, activism that takes on that kind of culty, world-defining meaning of the bad guy and we're the good guy smashing the patriarchy. I had a lot of arguments with feminists in my 20s, you know, about this language. But watching that language be implemented in a so-called place of higher learning, and we would have to go through these rituals, rituals of declaring our pronouns. And so it wasn't just declaring our pronouns, but there was so much sanctimony around it. There was so much, if, if, you, if you made a joke, People would like look at you, you know, or, or, or sneer at you if you made a joke about your pronouns because it's so important. This defines our reality. And listening to that and then being on camera in these rooms while people were starting to just do these weird testimonials and, and uh, this I believe. They actually had this, this ceremony, this I believe, that Evergreen is as racist as any Western institution. This I believe. And I'm like... What is go what is going on? It one, it's it's cringy, you know, so it's just like it's A like it's, you point. guys are fools. <laughs> you guys are fools. But the the amount of seriousness that you have in this cringy ideology that furthermore, if you watch how it is acted out in the classroom, it's that it's in it's empowering bullies. It's empowering dehumanization. I am a white man. I need to apologize for being a white man you know, or having, you know, this thing. It's like, and then that we have to do it and that everybody's on board. So eventually, this is this is the problem with Evergreen. I go on and on and on about it. But eventually the students went full bore. And I have a documentary uh, that you can find that we'll link in the show notes. You can watch just how far they go. And what I've tried to do in my documentary, because the students had this uprising that they planned out for a week and they filmed it all on their cameras and they uploaded it directly to the internet because they thought that they were on the right side of history, whatever history and right side of means. And so I've gone through, I've tried to, I've collected as much footage as possible and laid it all out, but I've also shown how the teachers were teaching all of these things. And I, I have footage of all these seminars. Robin D'Angelo shows up and does this really, well, she's Robin D'Angelo, you guys probably already know her, but you really see that these, this critical 
um, religion or this critical belief system based on some sort of dynamics between oppressor and oppressed and the student's behavior are directly linked. They're, it's a direct linkage. And so you started so. the YouTube channel fired up. You had all this energy yeah. anyway, so now you had a purpose. It's almost like I feel that you were looking for a purpose mm. till then. Well, I had meaning. I, you know, I, I, I finished by the time, like, like three months before the Evergreen Uprising happens, I, I finished my, like, book. Like, I finally finished my book. You guys can't see it. It's on camera. It's like this big old book. It's got everything in it, right? And I finish it, and I'm in the shower. I'm almost at the end of this book. I'm in the shower. Sorry for a shower story. But I feel, <laughs> I'm like in there. Oh, no, and please I bring on the shower story. I feel all this ambition and weight just completely leave me. And, and I feel that I've done my, I, I made a pact with my imagination when I was 20 to do this work, to build this monument and I've done it. And if nobody reads it, it doesn't matter if, if and even if I die and, and nobody in my life, you know, they don't find it till 20 years after I've done, I've committed, uh, I fulfilled that contract You've honored and, yourself. and. I've honored that contract, which was a big, I bit off a big chunk and I, I was kind of released. I felt released. And then I was like, oh, well, what do I do now? I'm free. What do I do now? What do I do now? So I kind of just spent those three months kind of finishing up the project and thinking about going to grad school and watching these protests start to happen around me more and more and just being disgusted by this ideology, just disgusted by it because of what it was causing people to act like was the most inhumane. It was just, we are going to be compassionate and despise people. It was just mm. so disgusting, mm -hmm. you know, and I had always, I've always, always, always wanted to write a novel about a cult. Like, like if I could show a cult in action, specifically, I was w imagining in my mind like this weird kind of in California, there were all these religious cults in the 70s and the 80s. And like, that's just a part of the American imagination. Imagine like being able to show how a cult happens and to show all this power, you know, and all this, all this meaning taking on this really powerful status over people and controlling them and blah, 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 blah. And you know, I didn't connect the dots because I'm like, why are you guys doing religious services? You know, why, why are these kids acting this way? And then being patted on the back, you know, and then, and then it, it flowers. And to tie up this part of the discussion, once all that footage flooded onto the internet, YouTube had a heyday because it was the most cringy of the cringe. So nobody had saw all the adults acting cringe. I had seen it and I knew where all those files were because I worked in the media department, which I got in trouble for knowing, but everybody saw the kids acting and the kids took that cringe and they ramped it all the way up. So there were all these videos talking and dismantling and Brett Weinstein was the center of this and he's a very articulate man with much more to him than just this, uh, just this one moment of him trying to reason with these kids, um, you know, because he's an evolutionary biologist and so is his, uh, his wife, Heather Hying, who I've had on my channel. And I hope you guys get her on too, because you guys would have an excellent conversation Great with idea. her about Lots anything. Um, but I saw all this meaning being made about this story or about this footage. All this material was going out and people were assigning it this political meaning specifically SJW cringe, which is at the high point back then. And then the left versus right thing going on and Tucker was on it. So it was just, it was material with a really intense attention value, right? It, it's just watchable. It's like watching a train wreck from all these different angles. But what, where did the train come from? We just know it's barreling and we know there's an explosion, but where did it come from? And then I saw some, some, some kid uh, down the street from Evergreen just started talking to his, his phone about what Evergreen's like, you know, but he like, he, there was, didn't have any context and he's like lounging around, you know, he's like, I'm a, I'm a beautiful gay man. You know, I know all about Evergreen, you know, he's like smooching at the camera and stuff like that. Um, I'm like, yeah, there's more here guys. There's more here. So I picked up my camera and I was at work and I was on campus and the, ca the feeling of the campus, like on a spiritual level, there was a whole reality that was not being displayed and that you couldn't display unless you were there. Like the way that your breathing would happen, the way that you would interact with people, there was a, there was a darkness, like and a heaviness 
after the protests, like they had really summoned something dark. And I had to, I couldn't breathe. I'm like, well, I have to speak and nobody's speaking to this. And so I just started speaking and I talked about preschool and I talked about Evergreen and I talked about how you say please and thank you. Not because that's the right thing to do, but because that acknowledges the human, the human that's serving you or the, the human that you're, you're serving and how that circuit builds up into a good community. But if you start from the opposite side and say, there's all these identities, there's all these groups and there's all this history and there's black and there's white and there's Latinx and all this stuff. And then you try to bring it to the human. You don't have that connection. You have, you have privilege and oppression. You don't have please and thank you. You have people, you know, ordering the president when he can pee, you know. Can I ask, you know, the way you've kind of ended up in gender, was that inevitable from Evergreen? You know what I mean? From gender. where, yeah, from, from where you went, was that always inevitable that you were going to end up in gender? Well, um, so you, the, the Evergreen State College stuff was about race and race in America is a difficult conversation. And there's a lot of vested interest in that. And it is really deeply embedded in our conversation. So it's really difficult to constantly talk about it. And so I documented Evergreen and I kind of diagnosed that one of the things my foundational statement is that people weren't treating people as people anymore. We were all bodies. They say that like zombies and the Borg, like we're going to act like the Borg and we're black bodies, you're white bodies, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, what's going on? This is really weird. But um, people weren't able to converse. There was no dialogue. So that edged me into after I started branching out from Evergreen, there was one step that went into the trans issue. Um, but I eventually started saying, okay, we need to perform conversation around this and actually dialogue about these issues in a cool way with a, with a mature attention span, right? So that was kind of on the back burner on like diagnosing the so-called woke or whatever you want to call it, this particular ideology that's taking over more and more of the American institutions um, is to, uh, it shuts down discourse and it shuts down higher order thinking. So the way to combat that without being against it constantly is just to do a uh, higher order discourse. So there was that development that I saw as the main way to fight against something that's cult-like. And then there's the ideology and, and taking apart the ideology and talking about how it doesn't work or what it does, you know, and, and the, the behaviors it manifests. And what happened was that in the winter, uh, in December, November of 2017, uh, months after what happened at Evergreen, uh, an incident happened at Laurier University outside of Toronto or in Toronto, Canada happened where a young girl, Lindsay Shepard, had been taken aside um, and grilled for about 40 minutes by, uh, the, by you know, her teacher and then the head of the department and then the DEI person. And the, the footage or the, the recording to, to that she fair, made To be fair, she was a TA and she, she a TA. showed a video in a class. She wasn't a student. A two-minute clip. Okay. Yeah. Well, right? TA, but she's but a master student. you said young girl, so. so it might sound okay. like she was just well, a student, like a very kid. Well, she was only 21 so I don't know. Okay. okay. So this 21 year old TA who's working on her master's degree in communications was teaching or TAing. No, I think she was like, you know, in charge of a class mm -hmm. about language. And she thought mm -hmm. that pronouns was an important thing to discuss. So she showed a two minute clip of two people debating about pronouns. So there was one position and another position. And one of the people was Jordan Peterson, who is in the recording, the teacher Rambu Khanna says, well, not to call Jordan Peterson a literal Nazi, but he's basically, he's basically like Hitler, right? And then they, they break down Lindsay Shepard in this struggle session where she's just started to cry because they're circling and they're forcing her to, to admit that she was wrong. And she's like, what are you talking about? So that happened. And then her footage goes out and then there's a big stir. All right, so there's the there's the incident, and the, the, then there's the media reaction to the incident, and then the students start reacting to the media reaction. They start having all these rallies and just doing all these weird things, performative things, and it was all about the trans issue. I, can I it ask, was all about how were, trans people were, are being. You were hooked at this stage. You were back. You were kind of saying, this is the same thing. It's over again. I've seen it like as a kid. I've seen it in Evergreen, and now I see it in gender. Is that right? My perspective on this story was that, okay, I've, I've done due diligence with Evergreen. I mean, I hadn't finished my Evergreen work, but 
I want to see if the skills and the critical skills that I've developed with regards to this racial issue at Evergreen can be transposed to this trans issue because it's the same behavior manifesting. There's just a different kind of language behind it. And, and so I began to just kind of take it apart, take apart this ideology. And then I started getting interested in, well, what is it to be trans? And I had a friend from Evergreen who was trans that we had a great relationship, uh, total military style, taught me how to shoot guns, you know, like this kind of the interesting um, kind of intersection of these different interests and identities. Um, and then when also I started to kind of try to decouple this is one of the processes that I was trying to accomplish in treating the material at Evergreen and Laurier was to decouple the activist from the community that they're representing because the activist is not representing well the people that they're doing. I mean, if you look at the Evergreen footage, there's very few things that could damage racial relations in America than Evergreen happening all over the place. Like that is just the most vile behavior in the name of racial justice. Also with the trans stuff, if if normies only see the tra radical trans rights activists who are specifically against free speech, who are constantly victimizing themselves and saying that they're victims and then grabbing a bunch of power, they're going to think in their head, associate in their head, that behavior with the trans identity. And those are two different things. The activist comes in and represents. There's not even voting. There, nobody, nobody elects who the activists are. It's all about power. It's all about rhetoric. This is all sophistry. This is all about politics. So, I think Sasha is very interested, from what I know, uh, in the in the way that you kind of you followed a, a path uh, during the kind of lockdown. Am I right, Sasha? That that's something that really kind of took your interest about following kind of. There was a lot of, of a series of interviews, maybe. And yeah, I, mean, I, I remember you talking about it, Sasha. Sorry. When I when I think about this entire issue of childhood transition and detransition, there isn't a person that I know of that has documented these stories in in-depth ways over a long period of time giving voice to so many people who pretty much were ignored completely by the mainstream media as you. And so many people have found their way to what they see as a much more reasonable, compassionate, whole person understanding of this through your gender series. So just off the top of your head, do you have a ballpark of how many interviews have you done? <laughs> <laughs> With trans people, clinicians, detransitioners, yeah. psychologists, researchers, do you have any idea? Because the body of work is really incredible. And I think so many of us who are doing this work, hmm. at least in part, owe you a big, you know, gratitude for platforming so many voices. Like, hmm. I, I really don't know if, like, you were the first person to do these types of interviews. And now there's literally like dozens mm. of people. Oh, great. So I'm just really amazed yeah. by that. And I want you to speak a little bit about the volume of work. And well, okay. I want to know what it's been like to be on the receiving end of these human stories. Okay. Well, if anybody takes anything and wants to know me better by the end of this interview, they could probably call me voluminous like that. <laughs> That's so true. Benjamin, the voluminous. <laughs> I mean, forever, by the end of my Evergreen stuff, <laughs> <laughs> my Evergreen series is uh, 130 me talking to the camera videos and 24 like documentary videos, right? And so that's just how I go. Wow. That's just I'm how still I roll, thinking yes. about the two and a half million words. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. And that, that I don't think that. Well, I think actually, it's I was always like that, but I think that that if there's anything that. I want Evergreen to know, be known for is that it is a place for somebody to really, really get into something and follow it all the way to the end, right? And and the, the setup for Evergreen is perfect for somebody, specifically in the humanities, though the humanities are totally screwed now. Can we, not, can we just go on the gender, though, please? Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs>
Well, I mean, I got into this thing because of how gender is treated by the humanities. And why, why I had a teacher say that I had a teacher say that everybody knows gender is a construct. And so and then I wrote a novel from two females point of view. And I turned that in for my final assignment. And she's like, I don't believe you're women. I'm like, OK, so is it a construct or is it not a construct? So I'm not I'm not being a gendered enough. You know, I can pretend to be a woman, but no. But but if I assign myself a female thing, you would totally believe me there. So there's something going on here. There's something yeah, going on. Yeah, that's here. interesting. So with regards to um, the gender conversation, once you get, well, okay, so there, there's the, just, you have to create content. You have to create content. You have to, there's two things. If you want to be a good artist, it, there's two ways to go about it. You be potent or you be prolific, and hopefully you're both, right? So that you, your potency has a value to it, but it's prolific. So there's, there's a lot of material. With regards to being able to do that on the level of the interview, you, I was contacted in the wake of Laurier by several trans people who said, thank you so much for, for respecting my identity as opposed to the activists. I don't want to control other people's speech. I have significant difficulty with my life, and I just want to ease that and go about my living. And I don't want to tell anybody else what to do. I'm not authoritarian, right? So I'm like, okay, there's there. But what is this trans thing? So you start to interview a trans individual, and you're like, well, that's one person's experience because it's all really different because it's so personal. And it has to do with this thing called gender. And then there's also all this research because there's this gender dysphoria thing. So then you're like, you produce some videos, and then there's these detransitioners. And then there's this whole network, specifically on Twitter at that point, there was this kind of this resistance that was happening on the level of the blog and the microblogging of Twitter of, of what is going on with gender and gender is being swapped. And it was a lot of feminists um, or people who are kind of in the feminist domain. I'm like, oh, well, I've always had a problem with feminists. Maybe I can start to understand them better, you know, because we seem to overlap on understanding that there's something wrong here. So maybe I can understand understand them better. And then somehow or another, I got hooked up with the Peak Resilience Project, which had Helena and Chiara and uh, Daphne, I believe, and uh, Jesse. Dagny Dagny. and Jesse. Mm -hmm. And Jesse. And they had a couple videos where they're just kind of talking to the camera. There was some kind of production. I'm like, okay, they, they need, they need, they need a good treatment. They need attention. They need somebody to upgrade their product by giving them a good chance to really go through and talk about what they're, uh, what they're trying to say. So I interviewed those four and Helena, uh, kind of st- stood out. She's a kind of a standout girl as, uh, I wanted to drop her name cause she was just on your podcast mm-hmm. uh, a few weeks ago by the She's time this star. is published. <laughs> but they were yeah. all a star in fairness, peak resilience. Was yeah, a, no, was a but they were they're, landmark like uh, really smart girls yeah. and they all had different stories and mm-hmm. they all talked about the this gender ideology and they were not being given the right platform and I, I felt like I could serve that. I could serve the story. I get content in return for creating something valuable, right? So the the, the values are I'm I'm not creating the value. The value's already there, but I get to I get to mine it. And so, and then I get content because I need to create content. And then also this other thing is served. These voices are served. And that led to just all these different lines of questioning. Before we started recording, Sasha, I asked you, are you guys almost done with all the content? And you're like, well, we have years of content yet to explore. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And with in my gender series, I have a series of well, playlist. I have a playlist specifically for detransitioners, but the I, I started a playlist called Gender, Sexuality, and Transition, and that includes feminism, that includes men's rights, that includes all the research, that includes detransitioners, that includes it includes so many different things. So it's almost it's almost uh, I, it's too broad. So I'm going to have to like kind of break it out because you just start asking questions, and then also the way that this stuff works is that you get known for providing content for a community, and then they start hooking you up with more people to connect. And then you have the parents also, which I, I have some problems uh, interviewing parents just because of the stuff that I like to do focuses on, on personal stories and, mm-hmm. and oh, I yeah, I gotta... have a problem with second order storytelling. And I was very graced. It, there's two interviews that I would like to plug. 
there's so many interviews that that were just phenomenal, but there's two ones that are stand out for me that happened earlier this year. One is with Vera, who is uh, she's in Norway or Finland, I think. I don't know how much they hate each other, so I think it's Finland. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's got she just she talks about how much distress she had and how gender was something that she thought she could use to exercise her demons. Uh, and I'm using my language here kind of ironically. Um, but she, she, it's just such a powerful human story. And also I was graced to be able to interview a father and a son and I will have to, I can't think of the name of it. So maybe you guys can link it in the description, but it was awesome to have a father and a son. And I think the kid is, uh, sorry, I think the young man is about 17 or something. Um, but we started talking, I thought we were going to talk about gender. We talked about autism. So the gender thing goes into the autism thing. And then the autism thing goes into, well, what is diagnosis? And then you're like, well, what is Asperger's? And then like, well, what is, what, it's just this huge network. And then you have the activists coming through and trying to force us to think in one way about this incredibly human issue. So it's got so many legs. It's got it's got so much value to it. So it's just like, why not? Can I do ask it? something? Um, you, you're so light and bright, chatting away, and you know oh. you're, you're giving it all. You know, and it's lovely. Is it time to cry? You're going to want me to no, cry now. now I'm going to bring it right down. Okay, <laughs> no, but what I what I was thinking was, surely it's been hard. Surely, actually, the activists going for you. Surely, it has been draining. You, you seem so cool about it, but I would have thought it was difficult. Well, you know what? The activists are idiots, so I don't really respect them. Uh, they don't respect they don't respect my values. Why would I respect their opinions? And I'm sorry to say that. Um, and again, I'm talking about a very specific type of activist who is about enforcing a certain point of view that isn't even allowed to be investigated without these really stupid name calling campaigns and stuff. And you can see that happening. And did For you get whatever rattled reason, at all at any point? For whatever reason, nobody's really come after me. Uh-huh. I'm not a threat. And I think it might be because I am a man, but I don't know. What do you think, Sasha? Well, I mean, you and I, we are friends. And I know that when you you. have a person who you respect, who makes a a critique of you that is really misguided, or if somebody really misinterprets your good intentions, it seems like that bothers you. Is that fair to say? Okay, yeah. I don't want to come off as somebody who doesn't care about what other people think. I do have very strong... um, desire to be honest and to be a good person, which doesn't mean that I have to be nice, especially to bullies and to, to, I just, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play your bully. I'm not going to play your bully game. And so when I began this thing on a, on a uh, strategic level, I'm like, okay, the bullies want to control the conversation and they have all the media, all the media, the government's behind them now. So they have all the power. Why don't I just, I won't even attack them. I'll just have a better conversation and not give them a, not give them, I'm not even going to deplatform them. I just pretend that they don't exist and go through and, and speak with actual human beings and people who can engage in deeper level discourses, whether we go into the realm of the personal or we go in the realm of the, uh, you know, the experimental with psychological, you know, how do we figure this out psychologically or like the research level, you know, it's just like whatever. Um, so I do get rattled though, but that's more about the broader issue of being a public figure or being somebody who is mining content from the collective attention pool. And a lot of the stuff that is, uh, very, uh, attention grabbing is rather negative. And the, if, and I'm sure that you both feel this too, the way that children are being sacrificed on the altar of gender is a very, um, it's, it's very, it, it's heavy, it's mm-hmm. heavy stuff. Child sacrifice is harmful. It weighs on one when reality is being, uh, is, is taking a back seat. Well, and, and I already said that people's cultural meaning is more important than reality in a lot of ways. And when you get into these topics specifically around gender and 
you know, why would we force a girl to act like a girl? Why would we force a man to act like a man? What do we do with the men who don't naturally act like men or who are effeminate, as we say, and the females who are um, masculine? What do we do about that? How do we figure those uh, figure out a way for normal, well, for broader society to accept them because there's a lot of bullying that is emergent. It's emergent on a playground. And mm-hmm. I was I was witness to that emergent behavior. It wasn't the kid's fault that they cast me out of the group uh, because the, the group cast people out. Um, and other forms of bullying that happen on the playground. It's not like a culture... The, the culture is necessarily – I think that there's a nurture and a nature thing. I think culture is, trying, culture is trying to enforce a normativity, but also that probably syncs up to some sort of biological imperative that we have towards creating men who are masculine and creating females who are feminine. And I think that works out on an evolutionary uh, level. Not to say that that is good. That's just kind of what is happening. It's all these different forces, but – when you look at social media and you look at what's happening with the race debate, with, which thankfully is uh, we're getting a little bit of a break from uh, 2020 kind of it, it kind of popped that zit and, and I'm, it's going to build up and it'll pop again, you know, and the gender thing is kind of at a high tide now. And, and in my position as somebody who's trying to create content that is relevant and that is valuable is that I have to kind of be aware of what's happening in the broader cultural matrix and find good conversations to have about these different issues. So your question was, does it ever weigh on me? And so, no, I haven't been... I think it. Uh, I think the calculus is is that if you attack Benjamin Boyce, he's gonna. It's just it. It's not worth it. I'm not. I'm not relevant enough, and to attack me would to make would make me more relevant. So it's best to just ignore me, and I've just kind of best best to just ignore uh, that people and to not really engage on that really surface level politicking um, and uh, the power dynamics that go on on that level. And anyways, I just want to have good conversations. Um, So I I have a question for you. I mean, you started, you started investigating the gender thing years ago now, and you've done all these interviews. Is there anything that you feel like you've been able to glean or understand now that maybe you didn't quite understand when you first started covering the gender issue? I've learned a lot. Um, I've learned a lot about women. (laughs) I I don't know if I've learned as much about men, but I have learned about um, specifically with, through the lens of autogynophilia and speaking with men who suffer very intense autogynophilic compulsions. Um, it's opened up some, uh, some questions around male sexuality that um, are really difficult to get invested in. Male sexuality is not as easy to talk about as female conversation on the level of the conversation. As, as female sexuality on the level of the conversation, because it is really intense and it is really objectifying men. Uh, men we have a target and, and we concentrate, we, we, we concentrate our desire and what we desire. And that, that's when, when I was 14, I, I learned that it was one thing to have feelings for a girl, but as soon as I started writing a poem, I took those feelings and it was like turning them into a drug right? I distilled and I amplified my feelings um, that were natural and I put them into this package and then you send it out and it's like, it doesn't even matter what she thinks about it because I already, I exhausted. And that's a 14 uh, year old position about, you know, which has to do with like being aware of the sexual compulsion and like that it's actually a circuit and, and stuff like that. So what I've grown through studying this is I, I just have more broader questions about how do we conceptualize man and woman? How do we conceptualize what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man, what it is to become a woman? Because, you know, women, I, I think somebody said women aren't born, they're made. Who was it? That was the first was feminist. De Beauvoir. Yeah, De Beauvoir, right? That, and that's true, a, a man is made. And there's, so there, there's an open question. Can we create a society where men and women aren't made? What's going to happen when everybody's just non-binary and you pick and choose? I believe we're going to just have to go back and reinvent the wheel and that there's a huge storehouse in literature 
about the masculine and the feminine forces and the male and the female and the needs and the desires and the tendencies. And yeah, the people who fall outside of that, the exceptions, they don't denigrate the rule. They actually inform the rule. And so speaking about gender, especially like, like the outliers of, of paraphilias or of gender dysphorias, that actually sheds more light on gender. And it actually reifies gender. And we see that over, over the time. A lot of the discourse right now is that non-binary is just re-implemented stereotypes. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's re-manifested archetypes. It's like, it's just, it's coming back. It's coming back. And so to what degree, I don't, I don't believe in enforcing gender. But I don't think that we are served by being so critical of it that we have to reinvent all of this wisdom that's been passed down to us. So, Could I ask, um, what do you think? You've had so many conversations around gender. You've gone so deep, like Sasha said, with I think you're the most prolific, certainly. Um, where do you think it'll end? How do you think it'll play out? Have you got a... <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, yeah. Well, um... You know, I've been thinking about this. What what China is doing? This is this. Is, I, I was thinking, well, you shouldn't bring this up. But what what China is doing is they're banning sissy men from uh, from all media. Right, effeminate men are no longer allowed in their media. Wait, and really? They're restricting oh. uh, video games to three hours a week or three hours a day or something. And so it's top down. And I was reading an article about this. The, the person who is designing their cultural dictate, and this is an authoritarian state, and I don't believe in an authoritarian state, but he's, he's, he investigated America and he's you know, investigated like degeneracy of society. And one thing, and Camille Paglia speaks about this too. When society enters into a degenerate phase, the gender uh, gender starts to be eroded, and you you lose out on a very important part of society, which is the heroic male, and which is the 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 patri patriarchal male. And so, I think that there's a lot of work to put the masculine in a beneficial relationship with the feminine and we're going too far by eroding the masculinity. So I, I think that what's going to happen is that the masculine is going to be pushed out of polite society. As you see, polite society is going to get more and more wishy-washy and uh, more and more just uh, eroding all of these norms and will basically lose all its potency as a cultural force. But in America, I think that 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 cultural force, that masculine cultural force will be, will pop up other, other places and will probably be demonized. But if we can put that really strong masculine force in a fruit, fecund relationship with a really strong feminine force on just a, kind of on a cultural level, I'm not saying enforcing this, and this is an impossible conversation, but if we can get those two things back into a conversation, then we, we, we have a generative society that has a strong culture, that has a, a tight-knit community because, unfortunately or fortunately, because of the, the consequences of male and female interaction, our children, that it, it, it shows us that on a creative level, I think, the masculine and feminine being in discourse creates good product, good content, and on a biological level, it does so as well. So trying to square that circle or tie that knot between the cultural understanding of gender and the biological reality of gender can't be understood without understanding that children are the result of that. And a lot of the conversation around gender within the, young, uh, the younger generation is because they are unmoored from having kids and from becoming adults. And so they don't even think about that at all. So there's a lot of a lot of their energy is going out into the void and into themselves because there's nothing to land on it. Not that I think that we should have a child policy. I'm not saying enforce mm. everything, but a lot of the affluence that we see is because people don't have to be responsible and they don't have to actually deal with the responsibility inherent in sexual intercourse. So big wow. conversation. <laughs> It's been fascinating to hear your yeah. reflections on all of this. Um, we Thank really you. appreciate you coming on. It's been interesting to interview you after having been interviewed on your channel so many times. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, you, know, you go into these things, you don't know what's going to come out of you. But, you know, the spirit, the spirit moves what it wants to move. <laughs> you can take that metaphorically if you need to. So thank you for having me. It was brilliant. 
Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RHYME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RHYME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 